Hello, everybody. Welcome to November's Q Docs and Content Call. We let me share a screen here. There we go. Welcome, Fadhil. This call is being recorded, so if you don't want yourself to be recorded please turn off your mic. We will probably hear some people enter in as we go along, so please excuse the, the, the bell ring as people come in. So the agenda today, uh, we will do a quick recap for anyone who wasn't at the Docs and call, Content Call, just a sense of, uh, in last month's episode, to jog people's memory. And then we'll talk about the follow-ups we've done in the month since. Uh, we'll talk about which a large part of that is going to be discussing the feedback that we've received, which was the main call to action that we gave to in the last call. We'll also talk about the beta.qlang.org updates, which um, essentially is why we are meeting, because we have a goal of, of launching that beta and trying to get to a place where we can stand an MVP for community contributions and, and uh, co-creation. Uh, to that effect, we also want to take a second today, more than a second rather, to talk about motivations for open source contribution. This is uh, an evergreen topic, but one I think would be nice to set aside to hear your thoughts about what your motivations or incentives are. And then finally, um, ask a time for question and answer sessions of any one of the maintainers that are here. Perhaps because we are an intimate group, we can also take the time to ask questions of the community uh, at large. And then uh, let's see where the discussion flows. So the recap, uh, these links will be available in a deck later, but we have recording and slides in issue or discussion 1964. And there were three main things uh, to, that we discussed in that first call um, the first is the structuring docs using the documentation diataxis. The link is there. And this, whether the content serves our study or serves our work, or if it needs to be in practical steps or more conceptual, theoretical, or informational, we want to use this structure. So if you haven't been to that site or are unaware of it, it's really a quick read and a powerful one. And it's what the beta.qlang.org technical documentation will use as far as its structure. Uh, then we talked uh, more broadly about the content delivery and how we're thinking about it. The main considerations and activities to, to, to carry out that plan, and they are the structure, so how the content is organized and displayed the substance, what the content should, uh, what content should be produced and how it should read and why it's meaningful and relevant. Uh, workflow, so how it flows th through the open source project. And finally, uh, governance, which is a, a fancy word for how we make decisions around what content gets published and why. All of this, again, is with the goal of having an MVP at beta.qlang.org. Follow-ups. So timeline and key dependencies. This was a, a slide from last month's call. So I thought it would be helpful to, again, jog our memories of what we were discussing on what was going to get done and then use a diff to, to review it. So last month, we had three main bullets here. We focused on three things. The first was to partner with the designer and one web development shop to work on the look, feel, navigation, and technical requirements of the beta site. Uh, we also, in the second bullet there, we put a request for feedback to GitHub discussions and more. And then the third is we would take this feedback and use that to build out content pieces for the beta using that diataxis, but also we welcome feedback for content needs outside of the site uh, for things like package documentation. So I want to take a second to focus on um, update each one of those bullets one by one, starting with this feedback collection, which was a call to action to submit your ideas to a super uh, issue called uh, super issue in GitHub discussions. Uh, just want to thank everybody who gave us feedback via that. And, and we were asked to add 
additional channels to meet people where they're at. And so these are those additional channels, the super issues 1995 for GitHub discussions. All these links um, will be available again in the, in the deck afterwards. We also, based on feedback from the community, we started uh, a dot uh, we, uh, that sometimes they would prefer a place to chat through some of the more unclear articulations of doc needs or pain points and ideas and such. And they wanted a more ephemeral place like Slack. So we created a docs and content channel in the queue Slack to soundboard, uh, let people have more detailed back and forth on ideation and processes and whatnot. And for those who have limited time or, or maybe want to stay informed or those who don't want to miss important announcements, we've added two places for you to get updates. 2008 is an umbrella issue for qlang.org updates. And uh, 2002, that last bullet is a project-wide announced discussion for all the things in the open source project. And lastly, uh, we've consolidated issue repositories in GitHub. So all uh, the previous issues that were posted in the qlang.org repository under the qlang namespace on GitHub, they've been moved to the main Q repository. So if you want to file a bug report, please prepend your issue with qlang.org colon and then use the qlang.org issue label. Uh, we don't have yet a template for bug reports for qlang.org, but if that is a thing that seems to be needed in the future, we're, I'll, we'll, I'll make sure that that gets done. But that's a to-do for me. Now, uh, in addition to all the channels and meeting people where they were at, let's go over what the feedback was and if we saw any themes emerge. So we had, uh, right off the bat, we had, um, instead of a substance of documentation, we had ideas or features or tooling to augment the documentation. And those included being thoughtful from the start about SEO, like meta tags and slugs and meta descriptions and headings and such. And then some things that are not yet implemented, but I mention them here uh, concretely because we do want you to mention it and say, I would really like this. And then we can put it in the queue for things and tools especially. So one was a doc command similar to GoDoc, if you're familiar with that from the Go ecosystem, enhancing the playground experience, and then inline interactive examples and giving us the time to explain what those might be and what those look like to you. Uh, we did also receive feedback about the substance of documentation, which was helpful. So package organization docs, there was a lot of um, trying to understand how to, you know, the gen and user directories in the QMOD directory um, and more specific things, but it all came down to how do I organize my Q code? And, and then to continue with SEO uh, friendly, exp SEO friendly explanation of differences between structs and definitions. And so the focus there is on SEO friendly explanation, trying to tease out the person who gave us this. What does that mean from you? It typically means being aware of all the search identifiers that one might come to when thinking through that. So it really brings to the table an understanding and awareness of what are the existing tool chains, terminologies, lexicons, jargons that they use to do that. Um, there's also some very detailed examples of technical things like patterns or typical constraints and the normalizations of those using Q. Uh, and then good examples of this I, of bridging, as we say, this for that. So understanding where Q can either fit into existing workflows or where it deviates from existing workflows or mental models. And then uh, blog posts around releases. As we start to, um, as you probably have attended community calls, but as we start to up our release velocity and cadence, perhaps having a detailed blog post around that would be helpful. Some additional feedback that we received uh, as far as doc substance is a similar uh, Q versus X page for many Xs. And that just because is just because people are already using a tool to get a job done and they need to know how Q is different. And this, this can't just be more philosophical or broad like CICD, it has to be specific to the tool. Uh, so that comes to the next point, which is 
that includes code examples for those common use cases and uh, integrations and being very, very uh, granular or atomic for each integration. We would have a, a specific piece of content instead of a giant tour where we lump all that together. But there's also some substance uh, things where um, someone wants as a learn more button, which we consider to be a very uh, like next step, top line journey in the, in the documentation, giving us an, um, an insight into what's most important to you on your Q journey, how you are using Q. And this person that gave us this feedback was, I need a, a, a tutorial about all the things in the command or the Q command line or command slash Q as we call it. And they also put very interesting wording here, which we really want to get to the bottom of, which is conversationally toned. So trying to ask follow and feedback, follow up questions to that person, you know, what does that mean? And so they say, devoid of um, being spoken at, but rather bring the journey a person along or maybe as a Socratic method. And uh, a couple more pieces of the types of content, again, just to stir the creative juices to get people who are watching the recording or, or who are here to say, oh, I have big picture content. I didn't know that this was on the table to put in the Met super issue. I want to suggest my big picture content. But here are two aspects or two broadly themed, the story oriented style of documentation for understanding Q's value from across the industry. So using the power of story structure in order to say that, and it typically is coming from a Q user themselves rather than say the maintainers. And we use different various industry verticals to say that. Uh, and then the last one is, um, and this is a big picture, which is thinking through an end-to-end -end workflow that it is results in some useful outcome. So we talked in the last, um, uh, docs and content call about quick how to's, right? There's a, a task, there's an outcome, you can get to it, you're done, hooray. But um, sometimes there's this just very bigger how to, right? That includes both learning and an outcome of that learning that can help in your work. And so it's sort of straddling and it's hard to, to sort of think through and reason through where would this fit in the docs quad quadrant? Um, but knowing and grounding in these common problems and building that generalized solution. This, uh, just so you know, is an interesting thing because it requires us as Q maintainers to be opinionated about it, or at least um, try to. So we, before we do that, we just wanna continue to interact with our users and our community to make sure that all the ideas that we have are grounded in the everyday realities of our users. Uh, I think we're almost done here. So um, I'm calling this paradigm changing or thought leadership a surprising amount of um, requests for things like, um, you know, why uh, using a configuration language with restrictions, right? We talk about it's not Turing complete and that's intentional. Why that is the better approach than using say general purpose languages for configuration. So maybe an explanatory or blog post on that. Uh, and then also backed with actual stories for showing how Q opens up new ways of development not available before. So to that effect, I just want to mention that Marcel developed a talk on something very similar for the infrastructure configuration audiences for QCon SF, um, which was languages of infrastructure beyond YAML track. And that uh, will be made publicly available either late November or early December, but in about a month or less. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing that may be made public available and please take a look at it because I think it, it touches on some of these very things. And this is the last piece about the feedback and the kinds of feedback that we received and were delightfully surprised by. And that is examples of prior art of existing doc sites and why. So we received, uh, and not everybody uses all the different uh, tools and technologies and operating systems out there shells, but when you do and you posted it in, we thought it was really great uh, because it instantly gives us a, what would it look like? So should you find a site with good docs and learning content and you like the look or the flow of organization or interactivity of it, please continue to post in the super issue, let us know why, so that we can start to uh, cobble together the best of as we grow out the beta site. 
So I went through a wide variety of different types of feedback uh, with the hope that you'll continue to give it and stir the jog the mind about different types of feedback that you can give. Again, there's no uh, no bounds when it took looks to how you learn. Learning is intensely personal and we just really want to get docs and contents that's uh, fitting the needs of everybody. But we also want to make sure that we're letting you know what are we doing with that feedback. Uh, so again, to return to this view of the timeline, uh, we were we were building out content of this variety, and now we are also do, doing workflows and processes, and we're iterating and improving on that. And we're coming out with an MVP content list, so minimum, like just an initial thing that could be in the bare bones of a new site that is useful but paves the way for more things to come. And then we want to be able to share that by the end of the year sometime. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that first bullet in the now block, uh, the workflows and the processes and how we're iterating and improving on it. So this again was from last month and some updates to things that we're learning as we're getting your feedback. So we really appreciating it, keep bringing that in and put it again in as many places as you think possible. We also got uh, private messages um, in various places and corners, right? I got Twitter DMs um, and I, while I don't wanna advertise that again, we are very open to what you are most comfortable. If you have a, a good opinion or a good idea, or even if it's a, an idea that you don't know is good and you wanna have a back and forth or a soundboard on it, please continue to add those content and ideas. I put, uh, discussion 1995 here because I want that to be the watering hole for how we start to think about um, where we synthesize it all. So uh, give it where we want, but then I will probably ask you, and I already have, if, if you've given me private feedback, I've asked permission to share it publicly or report it back to GitHub on your behalf. And so I'll continue to do that. Uh, we talked about this Airtable. Um, as we explained last month, we plan to synthesize and organize it, uh, the, all the content that people share with us into a table where we tag it. And so this is the, uh, all the feedback that I just you, uh, said over the various different slides, this is what it may look like. And these are the tags, the first pass tags that we assign to it. And so we, uh, as we discussed, it's gonna allow us to collectively build a process around the docs and where we have QLing start to build and create itself off the back of these tags and tag categories. And it's gonna facilitate and help coordinate these open source con contributions. So this also is how we're gonna unify the language and vocabulary of all the various lexicons and needs of across the ecosystem and see if we can say this one thing actually applies to various different identities, but simultaneously, but still use these search identifiers. Um, and then this is how a new sitemap emerges for the beta.qlang.org site. And it also how it ties into that, um, the flows from say the landing page. Uh, so for the air, in addition to sharing this air table, we're gonna, we're actively sorting out two other process improvements. And that is, how to prioritize content. So um, as you see in this create stage of the workflow, uh, we'll start to create issues and add them to a project board. And that is going to signal the content that's in the queue to get created and reviewed and submitted. But the decision process in choosing what content to focus on next from what's in the table, this is gonna have to be fleshed out. And it's gonna be done based on a number of factors. So the first is time and availability of maintainers. That's one factor we wanna do justice for anyone who takes, especially if you are a community uh, submitted suggestion where the contributor is willing to write the content themselves, then we are gonna make sure that we put time aside for review where appropriate and working with that contributor if needed. Um, so just making sure we set the right amount of time and resources for content that gets added to the create stage of the workflow. And uh, as mentioned earlier, we'll also mature the feedback processes so we get a sense of the impact and scope so that the time and effort spent will do the greatest good and finding a balance for docs needs for everyone from newcomer to advanced. 
uh, oh, those are different colors, but really what we're saying with them is we're chatting through with the web development shop that we've partnered with about all the technical requirements to test and automate content uh, and the code snippets that are written for the beta site. And we're moving along nicely with that. And we'll make sure to give more detailed updates once those are more formed. So beta.qlang.org, we said we were going to share the process or the progress. Um, we mentioned last month that we partnered with a designer and web development shop um, to work on that look and feel and navigation and technical requirements. So let's show. The first is a new logo. You may have noticed already in our slide deck, we have an old logo and we <laughs> threw, we just wanted a nice brand refresher. And so this is gonna be our new logo. Please feel free to use it in your sites, in your blogs, anywhere on Twitter, wherever you want, or happy to do that. Here it is in lovely dark mode. Uh, and then we also have a work in progress sitemap. So this is a screenshot of that um, where we're thinking not only about docs and how to structure and organize technical content, but also how that gets indexed and discovered. And also where logos, company profiles, case studies. So that story oriented aspect of docs, that's where this will all live. So another reminder, if that you, if you are an open source project or a company or a team within a company that uses Q, um, we'd like to use your logo. So, or we'd like to partner with you to put a, a brief company profile on the qlang.org website. So email us at documentation at q.works if, if you are, if you can give us your logo, we'd love to put it as many as we have on the beta site. And finally, we're thinking about helpful, thought-provoking visuals for the landing page. Right now we have, if you go to the current qlang.org landing page, we have a terminal screen running Q commands that doesn't give site visitors a sense of what Q is. So this visual is from a session with the designer where we uh, took the time to explain Q, but we'd really love to hear your mental models for how you see Q in your head which is a very hard thing to do, visualizing these kinds of abstractions, but it, it does need to resonate with the community more than it does us. So the fact that it comes from you is a thing that we'd really like. And of course, you know, we're also thinking about how that is gonna look on both desktop and mobile. Uh, here is another such visual of how, from Marcel's QCon SF talk, which is, um, you know, trying to, you know, as he said in the talk, pinning down the precise meaning of configuration. Um, so if Q has uh, adapters, right, and integrations for all these representations of a number of formats. Um, so that's one way that you might look at it, but you might be able to add another visual that has another hierarchy or relationship. But just we give you and offer you these, these two visuals in order for you to maybe help and share what your visual mental model might be. So I talked a little bit about the feedback that was received, the feedback loops and the content pipelines that we are creating and making sure that we have ready to go when the beta launches. And now we also wanna talk about a very evergreen topic, which is uh, community content creation for the ecosystem and motivating people. Uh, so various people come to open source for different things. Uh, some motivations are internal and increasingly we also have people that have external motivations. Um, but we'd like for you to share and give us feedback either in this call or afterwards in the super issue or super, super discussion, I should say, um, about what is what are some of the things that might motivate you to uh, or, or the community at large, or things you've seen in other projects that have worked really well. Uh, Roger, when I mentioned as him in the, in the um, re walkthrough before, he was like t-shirts, right? Um, you know, Hacktoberfest gave away a t-shirt, and <laughs> uh, you know anything that you think is motivating. Here we show a screenshot of a possible attribution. Um, it'd be taking an old documentation on the old site, but this would be in the new beta where we would give uh, an avatar um, and a author attribution that might be pulled from your GitHub av at avatar. 
and uh, we would scrub any kind of bots. So if you often see in, in code attributions, you'll see at the top of any file who the contributors are, or even uh, here we would do the same, but it would live on qling.org. And for any given um, primary author, that would stay as the primary author and anyone sort of doing nits or anything, they, we probably would have some decision-making method to say, well, thank you for doing the nits or running CI on it, but that doesn't earn you an author to kind of prevent any uh, abuse for people wanting to, you know, essentially get that green square um, without substantive work. So additive is probably the better word and not that that works, not valuable, but you get my, my drift. Uh, so that's it. Just thinking through visualizing Q, letting you know what we're up to, uh, and then having some time to also think through what motivates you to be able to, to do content, if there's anything that you'd like to share or things that you see other projects doing well, we'd love that. And with that, I am going to stop sharing and invite Q&A and discussion from the group. Cedric. Hey. So I've been working on a project uh, that kind of uses Q. I think Marcel and Paul are aware of it. But I, I think the main thing that's been teaching me is I wanted to develop some mastery over how to use Q, especially the API, to, to build things, because I think that's an important part of actually teaching that to others as well. right? And it also shows me which are the primitives that I'm going to rely on the most, what things that we need to actually build some kind of new product or a new workflow that is useful for people. And I guess the high level, what the, the tool does, it's called Saddle, is it will um, help manage repositories by defining configuration files as libraries for like package.json or whatever. And then a little declarative resource to say, I want to map this configuration to this file in this format, like JSON YAML. And so that will force me to learn things like, how do I um, write a configuration language that will be used in the package manager, the Q package manager, how to generate code locally, like Q code locally, so people could just like edit it afterwards and have 90% of the work done for them, as well as how do I, as the author, use the Q library or the APIs to you know, merge, say, package together or to do stuff like that. And so, yeah, it just seems like it's kind of similar to, um, say, using a relational database. You yourself don't have to like implement B trees, right? But you should learn SQL and how to use um, the language bindings of libraries, like the Python Postgres library to use. Um, the database is the kind of place where I think that's very useful for writing tutorials and um, that like base level of knowledge of like the usability. Of course, I think there's some responsibility for the API builders <clears throat> to create good abstractions and the right primitives that we can be productive in. And then I think from there we can expand out what are the things that we wanna cover and what's gonna be the most impactful. And I think we're really trying to drive towards a use case that's like you know, the main thing that really gets people to want to learn Q to solve that. And I think that just makes it a lot easier, right? If we can go, kind of come to that direction as well. Like what's what's the killer use case that people are just gonna be knocking down the door to, to use, to learn Q to, to solve, right? Paul. Yeah, Cedric, just picking up on that. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, I think taking your the example of saddle there is an interesting one because effectively you have two requirements from qlang.org at least as I as I see them you as the author of saddle um, i.e a tool that is built around Q wants to read content that helps you understand how to write such tools building around Q whether that be in go or some other language let's just assume we add um, APIs, SDKs, whatever, for other languages as well, right? But just th there is just Go now. 
and then the users of saddle as well will want to have <clears throat> excuse me like a primer on what q is and how to use q in the context of saddle and the i think that so there's two at least two requirements there from from your perspective for you personally and also the users of saddle and i think this um ties in with what the likes of dagger acorn and others who have built tools around q that expose q to their end users have also seen as well is that how can they expose good documentation to their end users in a way where they don't actually have to recreate the wheel when it comes to creating that documentation and i previously sort of referred to this and i don't know whether this is actually the right phrase um as as um as uh, white labeling the content where you could copy paste for want of a better phrase that learning material from qlang.org for use in your or template it whatever language right for use in the saddle website where you basically don't even have to rewrite any of it you can just copy paste it and add bits around it that make sense from a saddle perspective so you can help folks learning in a saddle context there what the relevant parts of Q are. Because um, when I spoke to um, uh, Darren Shepard about uh, Acorn, for example, one of the things that what they want to do is they want to present a data only um, interface to their Acorn users, where users write data only Q. So nothing to do with schemas at all, because essentially that's day one, that's a distraction for Acorn users. I stress on day one there, right? So this is sort of, there's therefore some overlap with what Marcel's doing in the language guide, but also other parts of the, the new beta.qlang.org, where we should help those tool authors like yourself, I think by creating content that you can easily copy paste or reuse or whatever in your situation <clears throat> so that you don't have to recreate that content yourself. So similar to folks giving presentations about Q as well. I think we should have slide decks, et cetera, that folks can just, use straight off the bat so that they don't have to recreate you know 10 slides on a primer of q similar similar kind of concept right so that we can help those tool authors um i don't know what you you think about that that's sort of the, the sense that i've had from a number of tool authors that i've spoken to personally at least that actually it we need to make that not only just tool authors but perhaps folks who are trying to talk about Q within the context of their company, et cetera. We've got to make it easy for folks to just pick up material and say, oh, I'm going to present this at the internal pr company presentation or something as well. Yeah, one thing actually related to that, and I, I can see what you're coming from. I guess I just haven't reached that part yet or I actually published it and people are trying to use it. Um, Q itself, just as a language, obviously fundamentally it's going to be more complicated than JSON. It's just how it is, right? JSON is simple enough that you can like read the RFC and like implement it in your language. But if we're, if we're talking about getting the value of Q, like in the whole two chain, like if people are going to use Saddle, um, are they expected to also like make sure to pick up the Q binary, like the, the CLI to like, you know, modify their Q code and do stuff. And does it make sense to make that easier on my side by packaging it some way so that's easier to pick up both? Should I like, I guess stuff like the, um, the language server could be useful there too, because um, maybe there could be a sub command and say it all just to like, fix um or like provide that feedback for improving the language and stuff especially if you're going to create tools like the trim and whatever how do we like get that whole experience to user they're using one of these tools and how do they get the benefits of the whole q language that falls up from that because i guess distributing that the distribution part is something that's going to be a little novel I, I can't think of any kind of um similar examples of what i'm talking about there um, I'll just briefly respond to that, but then I see Tony and Kevin have got their hands up. Um, in, again, just to pick up on that specific point about whether you bundle the Q command as well or not, uh, there are at least a couple of situations where you might not want to bundle it for whatever reason, but there are then certainly sub-commands of the Q command that you should almost certainly expose to your end users. So something like the equivalent of qfix, for example, if you don't bundle the q command with your with saddle, for example, having the equivalent of like saddle fix 
to to fix things like a la qfix a la gofix is almost certainly something you want to do so you can help your users heal their code and then that would just proxy to whatever qfix does that there may be other such commands but equally it, you, your, your point about kind of the lsp is a good one let's assume we actually do choose to ship the lsp as like a sub command of the q command which we may do we may not do because of course that increases the size of it but if we did then somebody's probably going to have that installed in any case because they want the lsp capabilities um, so yeah, I think it's not totally clear to me whether we should be include encouraging everybody to install the Q command, but I think it's kind of a, a relevant point that you raise is, okay, when we're creating documentation that is effectively like advice to tool authors, what should we be saying in that advice with respect to the Q command? I think it's a great point. Yeah. Tony? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think Paul just covered some of it, but, uh, you know, a few points. One was, you know, along the idea of like having cookie cutter documentation other tools can use, having like exposing some of these commands through our own tools is like really, it seems like a really good idea for a lot of use cases. I think one command that stands out to me is, you know, the, the eventual module and dependency commands, you know, something like Dagger or Hoff or any number of tools that accept Q as input, there's already packages there. And they can have their own sort of like package manager without having to have a second tool, which seems most helpful in like CI situations for a lot of cases. You're like, I just need to fetch the dependencies for this and then run this one tool on it. Um, I think on the idea of like uh, what tools need in their own documentation related to Q and how to introduce it, um, I've generally tried to, at least for my own documentation, like try to keep the Q introduction minimal and point to other references, just having like a one pager, kind of like the way Dagger did. They have like, here's a page, like a brief introduction to Q, kind of how we're using it. And like, here's links to go learn more, but then also here's some, they have separate pages for like, here are common issues our users have using Q with our tool. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess another thing is, as I've introduced Q to various other places outside of my own tooling, uh, I've just tried to keep it as simple as possible and trying not to use any of the fancy stuff of Q, but at the same time, you kind of like re prevent them from using that, which I think some people are exploring doing. I think you, you see people come in and be like, well, why can't I do this? Like Q supports this, why can't I do that? Here, you read Q. I kind of, you see it from like, yeah, it's gonna be the great conundrum of Q that it's coming, everybody's coming from it from all sorts of directions with different ways they want to use it and expectations about how they should be able to use it. It's probably like following up on the last call. Like that's probably the biggest uh, issue Q is going to face. Is like it fits everywhere, so you're going to have everyone's opinions. Thanks. I'll leave it at that. Kevin. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So I think I'm in a, a different uh, kind of boat in that. Um, you know, there's a goal of teaching developers Q, and then there's another user base where you're trying to teach end users Q, and they're very different, you know, use cases. So, um, Cedric, you mentioned, you know, JSON being harder, uh, or sorry, Q being harder, but I actually see for end users, it's easier because, you know, you have multi-line strings, you have line breaks, with something like IntelliJ, you could put um, language decorators on so you can get syntax highlighting even within you know, long blocks and you can put Markdown in there or SQL in there or whatever it is. And it makes it much more easier, you know, much easier for users to understand. My real challenge has been like that um, when you first learn Q, you go through the tutorials and you get your head wrapped around like that uh, hermetic value lattice space, whatever, and you could see it. So you could run eval, and I love eval because you could see, okay, these are the things that are complete and you can, you know, do syntax highlighting to find right away the things that aren't, don't have values. But as soon as you switch over to tooling, now you're back to like print statements. Um, and I'm in the case where I'm building like a Q library for people and I'm installing Q for them and giving them some little starter scripts. 
but it's very difficult for people who just want to get some some use out of their local Q library to start, you know, doing stuff with it to, you know, transform it for some documentation or to transform it to do other checks or what have you. Um, so the the tooling angle, I think, could use. Um, Um, and then related to that is it's very difficult, even within that space, to know the order of operations. So you have, you know, a struct that has a dynamic string that has a let statement inside it, and then you're doing, you know, uh, 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 a call out to somewhere else. Like, what order do those things get executed in? And you can't, you don't have the same visual component when you're developing tools that you do when you're developing in the, the value space. Um, yeah, and I just I just want to clarify that by what I meant by the JSON thing is that um, JSON is simple enough that you don't really require like a JSON CLI to work on it, and you don't have expectations it's going to be like a JSON trim for you, kind of thing. And so like if you want to be productive and get the full value of Q, right? That means it's on top of whatever thing you build, you probably want the Q binary to to do those transformations because you don't want to bring the whole kitchen sink into your tool. That kind of doesn't make sense in my opinion. And what's the best way? to achieve the value of Q, the language. Because it's like, there's mastery of your thing, and then there's mastery of Q on top of that. And so where does that land? It's kind Definitely. of trying to figure out. Yeah, I'm just pointing out that like the developer use case is just kind of the opposite of an end user. You have very technical people using it, and you also now have very non-technical people using it, just approaching it from different directions. So, you, you know, we're both right. Yeah, yeah, totally. Paul? Uh, Kevin, just to pick up on that point, actually, that was something when we were at KubeCon, um, we had a few conversations in the policy uh, space about Q being used as a policy language. And what you talked about there about um, effectively the end user requirements from learning Q being sometimes you know, fundamentally different it is, is really keenly seen in the policy space, to my mind. So specifically, we were talking with folks um, who are using Q as a policy language in the supply chain security space. And there, fundamentally, the type of Q you would write as a policy is, um, it is quite, quite different to the type of Q that you would write if you, you were trying to get hold of your Kubernetes configuration, for example. The, mm -hmm. the fundamentally different orders of magnitude, you're trying to achieve different things. And I think this points to a point that uh, Tony alluded to earlier on is that Q can be lots of Q can be different thing to many different types of people in many different types of situation with many different levels of technical experience and Marcel will speak to this point as well of, of how languages like this can be used by technical and non-technical folks alike and I think the documentation is really going to have to reflect that at least based on my experience and the the conversations I've had to date, but m more specifically the conversations at KubeCon is that we'll just have to make that documentation quite specific to those use cases, because that, as Karma said earlier on, that's where people are at. So if they're coming from the policy space and thinking, well, how can I write a policy to uh, ensure that containers don't um, reference this image over here or something like that, right? That's a very specific question that we should be able to answer and help folks with. It might not be all of the policy answers that they actually need, but at least we can help folks see as, as a taster what on qlang.org what that would actually look like, and then link them to some perhaps authoritative reference that maybe covers it elsewhere. But to the extent that qlang.org should become a reference point for these sorts of things or something like that, um, I guess we're totally happy for that to be the case. Um, I, it's not totally clear for something like policy whether that is the right place for it, but it could be, as in there could be good examples of how to write policy in Q there, but that doesn't mean it becomes the de facto home for all policies that you can write in Q full stop, right? So I think there's, there's, there's some balance between the two there, like where there's a learning experience, but it may be not, it is not the, the registry or whatever of all policies over time. This might be slightly off topic, but talking about ways to conceptualize Q, 
you know, if you think, I think about it as a tree and then you, you pivot the tree on its side and you have an outline. And so I'm a big fan of outlining type applications where you have a tree. And so when you could do a cube eval or export and you can actually see the tree as a tree, you know, as, as JSON, you know, naturally does, you can even some editors like, you know, uh, have like a structure view, an outline view, and you could see what you have there and how things zipper in together and how they fit on that end, you know, outline. So you can see you're starting with, you know, kind of a root node and it expands and then you can see, ah, that's how they're getting added. So it's a very pleasing, you know, metaphor. Oh, no. Did Kevin freeze? Or, and, oh, sorry. Um, you said no, metaphor. You said You're talking about metaphor. Oh, was that a while ago? Yeah. No, no, no. It's just about <laughs> five or ten seconds ago. It's a very pleasing metaphor. And then you oh, talk. Well, people know outlines from every editor and, you know, you know system that they have. So to be able to say, you know, the lattice is essentially building a top node and then everything else is a descendant, of, you know, through that. I would even like ways to encourage that more where we can put kind of, you know, uh, like tracer tags within the struct so we can decorate them in certain ways, you know, optional, of course, and as just values, um, but being able to, you know, raise errors and things um, or use custom colors and icons to like dress it up just to make it more visual in terms of what you're, you're doing and seeing. Um, Talking about visualizing things, um, that was something that um, Matt Klein also pointed out when we were at uh, KubeCon as well, is that um, if, you, if you have errors in Q, um, it's actually sometimes quite hard to actually trace where that error has come from and its origin. And experimenting with different ways of how to visualize those errors in Q is, I think, particularly within an editor that can actually support it, is, I think, going to be um, an inter interesting space as well. Um, and so folks who have good brains for visualizing these sorts of things, that's a plea there for how to visualize them. I'm sure we've got the front-end wizardry somewhere for actually diagramming these things, but just conceptually thinking about how to represent or visualize some errors would um, would go a long way, I yeah. think. Yeah, it would be really good to tie this also to specific uh, applications, right? Because there are so many ways you can think of visualizing, but unless you have a concrete, or having concrete ap applications really make this, uh, you know, uh, much more useful, I think. Uh, especially if you have a few of them, then you can generalize, but it will give better results usually. So if you have good examples, uh, that would be very useful. I'm, I'm not suggesting anybody use it, but it's worth checking out the Leo editor someday. It's like a Python environment, but outliner where you deal with small little snippets of code at a time, and it's, it's an outline-based editing environment. It's very niche. I'm just saying it kind of fits Q's, uh, you know, ethos. Okay. Are there any more comments, thoughts, discussions, things that weren't mentioned that are burning curiosities? Yeah, um, one small thing. I, I think I brought this up before, but I do think one of the things we have to think about as a community is that talking about the constrained nature of the language, I think a lot of the benefit is that it's more constrained, so it's easier to analyze, so we can build more sophisticated tooling and operations on top. But that means intrinsically that um, right now, building a new stuff takes time but we're left with the restrictions today. So I do expect there's gonna be some lag between sitting with the restrictions until we get like all the cool stuff that's gonna come um, and thinking about like, again, how what's the best way for distribution, how to use that the right way and how to um, create a cohesive experience for people like when they're trying to use Q day to day because I do think it's something that we want to have used across multiple tools, right? It's not like there's gonna be like a one super 
tool that like does everything. So that means it's going to be sitting in the middle and kind of like a standard and just like the best way to, to make that a good experience. And I don't know if I should bring this up right now, but I do think when we're talking about some of the problems with distribution specifically, what we brought up, Paul, is um, if we had a queue like server or database, I think it just like solve the thing because it's like inherently, you know, it's multi uh, process, multi computer kind of thing. And like we could probably like uh, do multi language because it'd be like binding to the server and RPC operations instead of trying to embed the queue engine and like multiple language implementations and stuff like the LSP, like into, when you do the R R RPC operations, you can give the feedback in, in the operation itself. Like I'm not asking to drop everything and start working on a database. I'm just saying like, I, I recognize these prompts in distribution. And I think just inherently trying to stack CLIs on top of each other might be difficult to do because just, you know, the, the inherent uh, restrictions of that versus we've designed inter-process um, computing with services before this seems like the natural endpoint. I think the main challenge would be, it works actually pretty well for stuff like um, infrastructure management because it just doesn't happen that fast. But if you were to like say you want to validate configurations very quickly, like in a Rust program, um, then you would probably want that in process. But for anything else, I think actually doing it RPC wise could be yeah. like a way to, to solve all those problems. Yeah, yeah I, th I think that's very uh, useful. So if you look at um, the OPA, right? Like the way they, they structure server, that's like a reasonable model that we could also do for Q and then of course more, more Q like, right? So there's, um, um, of course this also has to be designed. There's some really cool things you can do with a server that makes Q an insanely powerful, but maybe starting with something really simple, uh, would indeed be be quite good, right? I I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, you should do that. Unification as a service, yeah, that's what's kind of how they think about it. But like, you you turn all of those operations, and of course, it'd be easier to do it single language, so we can move faster, and yeah. just distribute it to everybody. Yeah, do I, I mean, yeah. You know, so what I mean with the OPA model, so people uh, like Kelsey recently posted a tweet like the thing that makes OPA so possible, uh, so popular is that it's easy to to integrate, right? And to adopt in your, in your uh, service. So I'm, I'm thinking more from, from that perspective, right? Like if you have a um, simple queue server, you have exactly that ability, right? And it's also, uh, if OPA is easy to integrate and this is also easy to integrate and using that same approach, right? So I agree that that's a yeah, good approach. Yeah, I just wanted to leave that comment specific because I do see some challenges around like this complex language queue has a ton of benefits, but then everybody wants to use it in some way. How do we get them to the high level queue features through their own tool in a way that makes sense and that doesn't require like a ton of distribution challenges? Yep. I think some of that maybe revolves around the errors proposal work that's happening as well. One issue I've had with Q is that um, while it's great that it tests everything, like even if the smallest thing is wrong, then you don't get anything back. The whole command fails and just says something's wrong and then you have to go trace it out. Um, it would be nice if there was something equivalent to like a, a try doing this so that you could say, okay, try doing this, but if it doesn't work, I'll keep working while I refactor. Like you wouldn't want just that whole model to be there and say, oh, it's broken now. Uh, you need some way to keep, keep you know, the purity of that, um, that model. Sure. Any other comments, thoughts, questions? Okay. So to wrap up this call, uh, just a quick reminder. Our next call and our last call of 2022 is going to be on Tuesday, 6 December. I don't actually... 
I think that is now we're in daylight savings. Sorry, we're not in daylight savings. Like that might be 1630 UTC, but it will be made available on the community calendar. And just wanted to thank everyone for doing it. Uh, slide and recordings will be added to QLang 2055, which is the parents' discussion. And again, a third time here, if you want to add your story, please uh, email documentation at q.works and then uh, subscribe and add to the super issue as we're talking, calling it, or meta issue, which is 1995. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next month. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. I'm going to stop the recording now. So, bye. Bye, everyone.